Osborne Young Reading Series One. Stories of Gnomes and Goblins. Chapter One: The Lazy Gnome. Harold was a happy farmer until the day a gnome arrived. This place looks good," said the gnome. "I think I'll stay." Harold couldn't get rid of him. At first, the gnome held on the farm, but one day he went on strike and refused to do anything. That wasn't all. From now on, I want half of everything you grow," he shouted at Harold. Harold didn't like that at all, so he agreed, but decided he would trick the gnome. Okay, you can have half the next crop. Do you want the top or bottom half? Um, the bottom half. That spring, Harold planted wheat in his fields. At harvest time, Harold took the top of the wheat. And had sacks full of grain. The gnome got stalks. Grr! You tricked me. I meant half of the field. Next year, I'll take the top of the crop," said the gnome. So Harold planted turnips. At harvest time, Harold had piles of turnips. The gnome got the top of the plant. Leaves, leaves. What good are leaves? The gnome was very angry. Next year, grow wheat again! He shouted. You can cut half the field, and I'll cut half. Whoever finishes first can take all the wheat. A race? Yes, and I'm small and fast, so I'll win. When the wheat was ready to cut. Harold went to the village blacksmith. He had a plan, but it needed lots of thin iron rods. I'm off to sow a late crop. The night before the race, Harold crept out to his field. He stuck the thin iron rods among the wheat, on the gnome's half of the field. You don't beat me so easily. Next day. Harold's scythe swished through the wheat easily, but the gnome's scythe kept hitting the rods. This wheat is very tough. Every time the gnome tried to cut the wheat, his scythe hit a rod. Soon, it would not cut at all. The gnome was so angry he shouted at Harold, "How dare you trick me again! I'm leaving!" In a temper, he threw down the scythe and stormed off. Harold never saw him again. Chapter Two, Goblin Hill. Jessie was skipping in the sun when she heard a tiny, tiny cry. "Help me, please help me!" When she looked down, there was a fairy stuck in a spider's web. "Help!" Jessie could hardly believe her eyes. Gently, she lifted the fairy from the web. "Thank you, thank you!" cried the fairy. "I was going to Goblin Hill for a party. Would you like to come?" Jessie's gran had told her stories about Goblin Hill. Not once had Jessie imagined goblins actually lived there. But now she looked closely. She saw a door. You saved my life. Would you like tea with the king and queen? Imagine going into the hill," said Jessie. But she was far too big. Until the fairy tapped her on the toe. The fairy opened the door and led Jessie inside. Welcome to Goblin Hill, Jessie. They arrived in the middle of a goblin parade. It's to celebrate the return of Prince Castor," said the fairy. 
Prince Castor was very excited to meet Jessie. He had never seen a girl up close before. You're beautiful. Please have these magic flowers. They'll last forever. He asked the goblin choir to sing a song just for Jessie. The royal band tried to play along, but they kept playing wrong notes. All together now! Higher! Higher! And now the balancing elves, said the king. Jesse clapped loudly, but they were more like falling elves. The balancing elves were followed by the juggling pixies. They were even funnier than the clowns. Finally, everyone sat down to a huge picnic in the shade of a lollipop tree. Let the feast begin! I must go, said Jessie at last. My mother will wonder where I am. Don't worry, said the king. Time stands still here. Don't forget your flowers. Jessie ran down the tunnel and rolled out of the door. Outside, the grass was a jungle. Jessie was still the size of a bee. But as she stood up, Jessie shot to her usual size. She looked back at the hill. The door was nowhere to be seen. Jessie shook her head. What a fantastic adventure! But would her friends ever believe her? Chapter 3 A Magic Bridge Jack had been walking for weeks. Today, the end of his journey was in sight. The city of Oxford, he cried. As the sun was setting, he reached a bridge on the edge of the city. He was too tired to walk another step. Ah, oh, it's good to rest my feet. Jack took some straw from his sack to make a bed. He lay down on the bridge. Soon, he was snoring gently. But Jack had fallen asleep on a pixie bridge. In the middle of the night, the pixies arrived. They flew down and pulled pieces of straw from his bed. One pulled too hard. He woke Jack up. Jack watched the pixies fly away on the straw. He wished he could follow them. All at once, he could. After a long flight, they landed on a chimney. One by one, the pixies flew inside. Jack followed. He landed in an enormous cellar filled with partying pixies. One gave him a silver cup full of a fruity drink. A band played and they danced all night. But as the sun rose, everyone vanished. Jack fell asleep. And woke up back on the bridge. He thought it had been a dream until he saw the silver cup. I can't believe I spent the night dancing with pixies. Jack tried to sell the cup to buy some breakfast, but the shopkeeper was horrified. This was stolen from the Lord Mayor's cellar last night. You're the thief! Thief! Police! yelled the man. Jack turned and fled. He didn't get very far. Those pixies planted that cup on me! Jack was taken to a judge who told him off. Have you anything to say before I punish you? Yes, I wish I'd never slept on that white bridge. You slept on the pixie's bridge? cried the judge. Why didn't you say? You're free to go. Just be careful where you sleep from now on. Chapter 4 Willow the Wisp Every day, on his way home from school, James saw a strange light. It shone far away over the marshes. When he asked his mother about it, she turned pale. That's the candle of Willow the Wisp, she said. Keep away! If you follow his light, 
You lose your way in the marshes and never come back. For a whole week, James tried not to think about the light, but one night, he just couldn't sleep. He crept from his bedroom and headed out onto the marsh. I'll just take a very quick look. A frightened frog croaked at him as he went by. Go back, or Willow the Wisp will get you. It warned. James went on. I'm not scared. A worried owl hooted at him as he went by. Go back, or Willow the Wisp will get you. It warned. James went on. If he catches you, called the owl, blow out his candle. That breaks the spell. James followed the light deeper and deeper into the dangerous marsh. The light was getting closer. I've almost reached the light. Ha! Now you're st st stuck. You will never escape. Never. Help! I I I can't move. James grabbed the candle and blew it out in one puff. Ah! As the flame went out, James found he could move. He turned and ran for home. He ran past the worried owl. Thank you. You saved my life. He told the owl. I broke the spell. He ran past the frightened frog. I wish I'd listened to you. He said to the frog, "I'll never visit the marshes again." You were right. I'm going back home. He scrambled up the tree to his bedroom. Safe under the covers, James breathed a sigh of relief. He put Willow the Wisp's candle by his bed. After that, whenever he felt curious about something, he looked at the candle. One look and his curiosity went out like a light.